miss my mind the most. <laughs> Romans chapter 15, if you will, tonight. I'll have you look at several places. I've preached in some different circumstances before. When I first started out, we used to street preach downtown Pensacola. I went off down the block by myself as a teenager, passing out tracks. <laughs> One of the guys told me when I got back, he was kind of watching me because I got way down there by the park by myself, passing out tracks, and there was a big black guy down there. And he was afraid for my safety. In Nuremberg, I got preaching out front in front of the Lawton Scooter here, and uh, had, had a crowd. I don't know whether they were mocking me or the guy that was bothering me, but I had a crowd of people standing there listening. They told me later, this guy that was heckling me, he'd come here, I'd preach there, he'd come here, I'd preach here. They said he had a corkscrew in his hand. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> but I think tonight may be the closest that I've had to come to preaching by faith. Amen. There. Romans chapter 15, verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For what, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're all familiar with verse 4, that it says <clears throat> that the things that are written in the book, in the scriptures, were written aforetime for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And I call your attention, of course, to that phrase there, comfort of the Scriptures. Now I'd like for you to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and it's another passage that you're familiar with. 1 Corinthians chapter, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul says in verse 2, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Amen. And I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about the comfort of the Scriptures. Now... Uh, there are a lot of things that you're going to run into in life and uh, a lot of troubles that you're going to... you have a lot of blessings. You'll have a lot of things along the way that will make you glad. But there are going to be some things come in your life. And uh, a lot of times, you know, as young people, kids, you know, you watch kids, little things bother them. They fall down and skin their knee. That's terrible. It ruined their day. It's like, kid, if you, know what was, if you knew what was coming in life, you know, that wouldn't bother you a whole lot at all. There are going to be some things come your way, brother. You're going to need some comfort. And, of course, I suppose probably at least 90% uh, of you already know that when trouble is there, the place to go is the song. Not because it gives you the answer, but because, because it gives you what to cry out to God. That's what David cried out to God. Asaph cried out to God. Heman cried out to God because they were in trouble. And that's the only place you can go when you're in trouble. The comfort of the scriptures. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the chance to be here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that we have in you. I thank you, Lord, for the chance to stand here and preach. And you know that I'm not worthy to. But, Lord, i got a book here. And it's about all that helps us through this mess down here, Lord. And I pray that you'll show us some stuff from it tonight. Give us the comfort and the strength that we need. 
In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Psalm 86, verse 17, David says, Show me a token for good, that they which hate me may be ashamed, because thou, Lord, hast opened me and comforted me. He says in Psalm 94, 19, In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Uh, 1984, it was uh, my wife and I, Hannah and Christy, took off from Pensacola Airport, went to Germany, and uh, we landed there in January of 1984, and about a year and a half later I got a call on a Saturday afternoon, and uh, Brother Ruckman's wife uh, was on the phone, and he says, uh, she says, Brother Ruckman wants to talk to you. And he got on the phone, the first thing he said was, are you sitting down? And I'm going to tell you something, buddy. If somebody starts that way on a phone call with you, you better. You better sit down. He called to tell me that my dad had died on uh, Saturday, August the 3rd. And that uh, it was just a, a thing. He got out, got overheated, I guess, had a heart attack, and was gone just about before they knew it. And I'm going to tell you, when something like that happens, it hits you like a freight train. If you've lost somebody close to you, if you've lost a parent in here tonight, you know what that's like. There, I don't care whether you're ready for it or you're expecting it or it comes as a complete supply, surprise, you're going to get run over. I mean, it's just going to splatter you all over the place, man. That hurt! Yeah. Yeah. My wife tried to comfort me. We were trying to make preparations to get back over here for the funeral. And she did her best, tried to comfort me. But I'm going to tell you, uh, there wasn't a whole lot she could do. Uh, that hurt. I read across a verse in the book of Job. The Lord gave me something to comfort me. And it may not seem like much to you, but it was from him. It's Job chapter 21. Verse 23. It said, One dieth in his full strength, being holy at ease and quiet. My dad didn't have to go through, you know, suffering a whole lot. Uh, he was he started having pains in his chest and within about an hour, hour and a half he was gone. And the Lord gave me that said, you know, he didn't he didn't have to dwindle down to nothing. He didn't have to go through a whole lot. It's just up and gone. And he did give me some comfort. He gave me some comfort there. It still hurt for a long time. Now if you've lost a parent, you know that's bad. And uh, after that, I've, I've told people there are going to be times in your life, and there are going to be times looking you all right in the eyeball because it's going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. There are going to be times in your life when things will happen, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Mm -hmm. Nothing they can do about it. Yes. And you're going to need help from God. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you something. If you don't get help from Him, you're not going to get help. Yeah, amen. You're not going to get help. And my wife was probably ten times worse. I told her, I don't know if she got the message, but I sent it to her. Christian sister that we've known their family, oh, since the 80s. Her husband died this last year. I told her, I said, I'm not going to try to give you all the typical Christian words of comfort because they don't help. And some of you, I know that's going to sound like blasphemy, but you wait till you get there. I mean, it's a blessing to me. I, I told somebody shortly after Karen died, I said, you know, it occurred to me. I didn't, wasn't tempted particularly to get bitter, but it hurt. Well, I mean, you just can't explain it unless you've been there. You don't know what it's like unless you've been there. You just, believe me, you don't know. And uh, I told somebody, I said, it occurred to me, though, if it hadn't been... For what the Lord did on the cross, she'd be in hell right now. And she's not. And that's big. And that's big. You begin to see things in songs that you didn't see before. Right, Dan? Amen. You begin to see, hey, I was reading and seeing what this guy was saying, I had no idea. How many of you have ever heard Brother Roloff's tapes where he sings that song, 
far away beyond the starry sky where the love lights never, never die. I stood by my wife and watched them go out. Told Brother Meenan the other day, I went up to him and I said, Brother, are you sleeping? I said, No. I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating. He may have improved for him a little bit then. I told him, I said, Brother, I wish there was something I could do. But I know there's nothing anybody can say or do to make the pain. My way of explaining it is like somebody reaches down inside you when they go and grabs you somewhere down around the ankles and just rips the inside mm -hmm. right out of it. I don't know how other people would put it, but believe me, I stood and watched my brother's wife die a year and a half before that. And when she went, I just backed right out of the room. And I knew this was this is more than I can handle. But I had no idea. Listen, there are going to be times when you need comfort. In your Bible, there are three things that are practically inseparable. <clears throat> Faith, patience, and hope. You can't have hope if you don't have faith. You can't have faith without the patience to wait for the end, brother. You're going to have to have faith and hope and patience. Paul said, now abide it. Faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity is kind of in a class by itself, leaves faith and hope. Take your Bible and look in Romans chapter 8, and I'll kind of show you what I mean, and then we'll go on. Romans chapter 8. He says in verse 24, For we are saved... By hope. Now, of course, your your holiness, they'll say, well, I hope I'm saved. Not what he's talking about. <laughs> but he says, we're saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Doesn't the Bible say in Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace are you saved through faith? Isn't that what it says? Somebody said, yes, because I don't all know the words. For by grace are you saved through faith. He said, we're saved by hope. And he says, then do we with patience. Wait for it. You know, we say, yeah, I'm saved. Well, yeah, you are. That's kind of the way God sees it, okay? Were you ever actually, I'm not trying to be, you know, her heretical here, but were you ever actually dropping off into the fire yet? For what a man seeth, why have he yet hoped for? Yeah, you're saved, but you're going to, I mean, the real action of it is going to happen one day. I mean, when you step out of this body, Amen. if that day comes before the Lord comes back, that's the point at which the salvation actually occurs. Amen. I mean, that's the point where it happens. Amen. You should go down, and you start going up. Amen. <laughs> Brother, Amen. That's the salvation. So he says, we're saved by hope. And we haven't seen it yet. We know it's true. One day we'll see it happen. Amen. There are things in the Bible, you know, <laughs> that uh, you learn along the way. I'm not going to try to cover everything tonight. There's no way I can do that. Let's see. Yeah, Habakkuk, that's what I want. I'm going to read you a couple of verses out of Habakkuk. Chapter 2. Verse 3 it says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Isn't that what we say at the ball game? Wait for it. You guys know what I'm talking about. Now, come on, y'all looking at me like a tree full of owls. Isn't that what you say at the ball game? Wait for it. Oh, yeah. Though it tarry, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. It's going to happen, brother. 
Uh, if God makes you a promise, it's going to come through. Amen. Amen. Now you say amen, but see, sometimes it just seems like it takes him too long. Yeah. You know, amen. we don't we don't have that long down here, Lord. <laughs> I mean, most of us, you know, 70, 80 years, and let's put it this way. I told my boys not too long ago, I said, guys, look at me. I can remember being a kid like you. It really hasn't been that long. I'm almost 55. If my dad lived to 60, if I make it as far as he did, and I don't have any guarantee of that, I might make it longer. But if I live as long as he did, i got five years. And you say, Lord, how long? How many, how many times have you read that in the book of Psalms? Lord, how long? How long? And we sing the song, you know, Ere we shout the glad song, Christ returneth. Hallelujah. How long? How long? But God will keep His promises, even if it seems like it takes Him too long. Take your Bible, look in Psalm 37. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Now, do you see what all it tells you to do there? We like to emphasize the part about what the Lord's going to do for us, right? Mm -hmm. I like those parts. You know, thou shalt be fed. You know, thou shalt dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. He shall bring it to pass. See what he says for you to do? Trust in the Lord and do good. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself. Sometimes it seems like, yeah, the Lord's going to keep his promise, but it takes way too long. Let me, let me say this. You should have gotten some promises from the Lord by now. If you've been around very long, you should have been praying over some things, agonizing over some things, in anguish about some things, and go to the Lord... And there ought to be times when he has put something in front of your nose in that book and made you a promise. Mm -hmm. And some of those promises you should never expect to see completely fulfilled. Amen. I prayed about my family. I don't know, you know, what comes down the road. I'll tell you what I did find out years ago. My wife's ancestry goes back to some Huguenots. To some people that came over from Germany too, um, and they were they were Lutherans and converted over when Count Sinzendorf was up there setting up churches. They converted over to Brethren, and I'll bet there was some praying going on there that's still having an effect. She got saved. Our whole family got saved except for maybe your mom. We couldn't figure that one out, but uh, we hope she did. But I mean, brothers and sisters, everybody got saved, and they were raised Catholic. Don't you know somebody's been praying? I got praying about my family. The Lord gave me a promise. I got it written down, brother. And I don't expect it to stop when I'm gone either. Because the promise He gave me doesn't stop there. You got any promises that the Lord's given you? Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Look at this one. The Lord Dave made David a promise. And you're talking about a promise, brother, sister. This is a promise. This is kind of like the one that he gave me. Put your hand on that thing and hang on like we sing, you know, I have an anchor that keeps the soul. Yeah. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 19. David prayed before the Lord after he got this promise through Nathan. And he says, And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, but thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the matter of man, O oh Lord God? No. Only the Lord can make those kinds of promises. Amen. 
promises. You know, the Lord made Abraham some promises. Yeah. Did you ever... Did you ever stop to consider when the Lord started talking to Abraham about his descendants? It's in Genesis chapter 12. Look at it. Abraham was probably a pretty young man here. I wouldn't say he's in his 20s. Probably, probably going to come more like 40s, 50s, something like this. But the way your King James words this here might, uh, might push it back even a little bit further. <laughs> Of course, all the new Bibles want to change it, try to make things a little simpler for them to explain. But anyway, look at verse 1. Now the Lord hath said, past tense to the past, you know, hath said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. Don't you know that got Abraham excited? Man, he probably thought, man, I'm going to have kids all over the place. I'm going to have grandkids and great-grandkids, and there's going to be so many of them I'll never even know. You know, I'll be walking by them saying, who are you? <laughs> Don't you know that got him all excited? I'm going to make of you a great nation, Abraham. Abraham went out, told, uh, told the Lord, I'll go, and he went, and uh, he went to the land that the Lord uh, didn't show him where it was going to be, just told him, you go, and I'll guide you, okay? So he went out there and he wound up in the land of Canaan after his father died and he waited around there and he waited around there and he waited around there and he waited around and he waited around, and, he waited around and, he waited around and nothing happened. He's got riches, he's got cattle, he's got servants, he's got everything a man could want but children. Now ladies, you're more geared to wanting the children than the men are. But after a while, the man's going to say, man. Well, let's look at it. Look in chapter 15. Verse 1. After these things, <laughs> quite a bit already passed under the bridge, you know. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Hey! You will need to get to where you realize that he's all you need. But, like all the rest of us, Abraham kind of figured he needed something else. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Well, what good is it going to do for you to give me all this stuff? I'm fixing a croak here and leave it all to who? To who? I don't even have a kid. I don't even have a son. I don't have a daughter, let alone a son. I don't have anybody to give it to you. You're giving me all this stuff here, and it's great and everything, but who am I going to give it to you? You said you're going to make me a great nation. I don't have a child. Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. Amen. Patience. Patience. See it? Patience. He's been waiting for years and years. And years, they say, Lord, you've given me nobody. You know, you haven't given me a son. The Lord brings him out there and says, Abraham, look up there. See those stars? Oh, Lord, they're nice. See how many there are? You know, I don't even know where they all are. I can't spot the same ones every night anyway. How many of them are there? Well, I'll tell you what, Abraham, you count them. If you can count them, that's how many kids you're going to have. That's, that's your descendants right there. You've been waiting for years. He says, okay. You know what most of us would say? No. <laughs> promises? Promises. Yeah, All I right, get is right. promises. <laughs> oh, it's not over yet. <laughs> Look down at verse 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them. Oh, that's good news. 
and they shall afflict them four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou, <coughs> guess what, Abraham? <coughs> I'm not even going to see it. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Oh boy. <coughs> and then there's all the stuff with Ishmael. You know about that. Uh, uh, chapter 16, Sarah gets the bright idea to try to get some children through her handmaid there, and that made a mess. Then in chapter 17, it says, And when Abram was 90 years old and 9. Now how old was he when he left Ur of the Chaldees? I don't know, but I'll bet it's been 40 years since the Lord told him, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And guess what? Nothing. That's what. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk thou before me, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, me behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father. Ho, ho, look, it's, it's an increase now, a little bit different. Not a great nation, father of many nations. That's great. Where is it, Lord? <laughs> when? Hmm. Chapter 21. And you can go home and read all the stuff that happens in the intervening time about Sodom and all that stuff. And Abimelech and him trying to take Abram's wife, and then finding out she's his wife, and all that. Verse 1 in chapter 21. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived, and bare Abraham, a son, in his old age. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. Laughter. And you know that story, I'm sure. He was an old man. Yeah. This is after he was over a hundred years old. But let me tell you something. You're going to need patience. Praise the Lord God, will keep his promise. Mm -hmm. Has he made you a promise? Maybe something that you wanted, like right now, <laughs> and it ain't going to happen. Maybe something that you just can't wait to get your hands on, and you're going to have to wait. You know, that's what kids hate worst. You can tell them no, and they'll have a fit, but if you tell, tell them wait, <laughs> not yet, not right now, oh, so that's like, um, you might as well grind them up in a meat grinder. <laughs> it's not over yet. Look in chapter 22. Verse 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Got patience to wait. You know it says in the book of Hebrews that he received him back from the dead in a figure. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know something else? Another thing that kind of bothers us is sometimes we ask the Lord, we don't get a promise. <laughs> he won't do what we're asking him to do. You can't move him. He's got his mind made up. No matter what you say, what you do, it's not going to change. The answer is no. What do you do about that? Say, how do you get any comfort out of that? Well, that's not very comfortable. That's not much fun when the Lord says, uh-uh. -oh. You say, but Lord, he told, he told Moses, you're not going over. 
Moses said, but Lord, and the Lord finally told him, said, Moses, don't speak to me about it again. Well, if he does that for you, you can be sure it's for your own good. It's for your good. Look in Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 10. Well, verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, mm -hmm. that we might be partakers of his own. Now no chastening for the present seems to be joy, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You know, we're in Romans chapter 5, it, it says, Tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience, and experience, hope, and hope make not ashamed. Tribulation worketh patience. You know why God puts you through the things he does? Because he knows the only way to teach you is to just stick you there where you can't get out. I was telling my brother here not too long ago in a particular situation that I find myself in. It's like the Lord's got me hog-tied. <laughs> I mean, amen, just amen. bound, and I can't go forward, and I can't go back. I'm stuck right there. I can't wiggle. <laughs> When you're in a situation like that, you just have to put up with it. Mm -hmm. Like Lyndon B. Johnson said, they say, they said, he, he said about being president after Kennedy was killed, he said, being president is kind of like being a jackass in a hailstorm. <laughs> but all you can do is put your head down and take it. <laughs> and the Lord will put you in situations like that, brother. All you can do is put your head down and take it. The way we sing it's this. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength. I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. He, whose heart is kind beyond all measure, gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Help me then in every tribulation so to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. David said in Psalm 119, verse 49, Remember the word unto thy servant, upon which thou hast caused me to hope. Mm -hmm. Offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take us from my Father's hand. One by one the days, the moments flee, till I reach that promised land. What the Lord will do to you, he'll put you in the fire. He'll give you some troubles. He'll put you in a situation where you want something. Yeah, and know. then he'll put his, what he'll do is he'll take out his, <coughs> his torch, buddy. And he'll set that thing, put a nozzle on it, set that thing, and he's ready to cut. You ever seen a guy use a cutting torch? That thing's got some power. It's got some heat, man. And he'll get that one particular spot and he'll put that torch right on. And he'll burn it out. We saw, no, wrong side. He sat by a fire of sevenfold heat as he watched by the precious ore, and closer he bent with a searching gaze as he heated it more and more. He knew he had ore that could stand the test, and he wanted the finest gold to mold for a crown for the king to wear, set with gems of a price untold. So he laid our gold in the burning fire, though we fain would have said him nay. And he watched the dross that we had not seen as it melted and passed away. And the gold grew brighter and yet more bright. But our eyes were so dim with tears, we saw but the fire, not the master's hand, and questioned with anxious fears. Yet our gold shone out with a richer glow as it mirrored a form above that bent over the fire, though unseen by us with a look of unspeakable love, can we think that it pleases his love and heart to cause us a moment's pain? No, no. But he sees through the present cost to the bliss of eternal gain. 
So we waited there with watchful eyes, with a love that is strong and sure, and our gold did not suffer a bit more heat than was needed to make it pure. Mm -hmm. and a lot of y'all parents, you like to see your children hurt, sick, doesn't mess you up when they're, they're sick, you know, and you can't figure out what's wrong, you can't do anything about it, you can't fix it. How would you like to be able to? And have to not. He can fix it. And he has to sit there and let it go. How about if they were dying? And you could stop them. And you had to not. See, the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Doesn't mean he likes it. Doesn't mean he treasures it. Means he attaches great importance to it. And that it receives his utmost personal attention. So, if the Lord says, no, it's for your good. Mm -hmm. Next thing is this. God takes care of us and gets us through in spite of our unfaithfulness. You all might have to bear yeah. with me just a little bit if you will. He gets us through in spite of our unfaithfulness yeah. and our sins and our failures. That ought to be a comfort to you. I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe you hadn't run up on that too much yet, but you will. <laughs> Another thing I told my Sunday school kids, I don't know if there are any in here that will remember it or not, the boys when they were in there, was this. You're little now, you know, your parents, they tell you what to do, what not to do, when to get up, and when to go to bed, and go to church, and all that kind of stuff. The day's coming. <coughs> You'll have to make up your mind and do that yourself. So you might as well make up your mind while you're little. Before it gets rough to figure it out that you're going to do right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I tell them this. I say, as you grow up, you're going to be watching people around you and you're going to see them all mess up. You're going to see me mess up, I'm going to disappoint you. Somewhere down the wrong line, you're going to see me do things wrong. You're going to see Brother Ruckman do things wrong that you know are wrong. And you know good and well he should know it. Or does know it. And does it anyway. He's going to do things wrong. Your parents, kids, <laughs> I tell them, the day is going to come, you're going to get smart, you know, you're going to be begin to see things, and you're going to see them do things wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's going to disappoint you. You're going to realize they're not what I thought they were. Yeah. Well, I got bad news for you. Nothing's going to hurt you. Nothing's going to disappoint you as bad as the day when God let you fall on your face and shows you what you made out of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But he's going to get you through in spite of it. He did yeah. Adam and Eve. I mean, they said, <coughs> what should he have done there? Me? Uh, would have been over. Scrap it, start with a new one. That's <laughs> so all it was to it. Not the Lord. Clothed him with skin. Took care of them, got them through. In spite of their sin. Samson, strong man. If any, if any man ever had what it took to be the outstanding man in history, it was Samson. I mean, you're talking about Superman? <laughs> really? Really? Blew it. All two pieces. But God got him through. I guess you could say it that way. David, David's a great man, but hey, you know, we could just keep going. I will say this, this ought to help you a little bit. He's going to whoop you, he's going to burn you, he's going to, he's going to, like the Lord said, he's going to trim on you, he, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and he's going to, he's going to prune you and everything else, and he's going to work on you to get that sin out. Amen.
much as you want it and can't attain it, eventually he is going to give you victory over that sin. Praise God. He is. But you know what? And this really ought to help you, at least it does me. <laughs> God uses failure. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hey. You believe you do. Look in 1 Corinthians, you read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many not mighty, not many noble are called. Once in a while. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world. You ever feel like you just, oh Lord, I'm an idiot. The foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world. Oh, Lord. Sheesh, Lord. After all that, I'm not worth two cents. And things which are despised hath God chosen in things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. He uses failures. Can you imagine Moses? Now Moses started out good, didn't he? Son of Pharaoh's daughter, actually, a Hebrew. He goes out, he's, he's cast off the world, he's rejected everything there with all its riches and the learning and the wisdom of Egypt, and he goes out to see his brethren, how they're doing, you know, and he finds his Egyptian beating up on a Jew and finishes him off. And he thought, the Jews would pick up on the idea that the Lord was, I don't know where he picked up on it, but apparently he had, that the Lord was going to use him to deliver Israel from Egypt. Goes out the next day, finds two Jews fighting with each other, tries to straighten them out and get them reconciled, and one looks at him and says, who do you think you are? What, are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? Takes off running for his life. How do you think Moses felt after he'd been out there taking care of sheep in the desert for about 35 years? I'll bet, I'll bet there were a thousand times he said, oh, night, man. With my own two hands, killed an Egyptian, buried him in the sand. How stupid can you be? How wicked can you be? No way God's going to use me, a murderer? Mm. I mean, I started out good and just blew it. Got ahead of God. Got in the flesh. Did it my own way. You know, thought I knew what I was doing. And pff, here I am. Mm. 35 years. Walking up and down in this God-forsaken <clears throat> bacon desert, taking care of a few sheep out here, trying to eke out some kind of a living. Take care of my wife and half the time I ain't even home to see her because I'm out here leading these sheep around. Don't you know that went through his mind? Hmm. You ever feel like a failure? Yeah. 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 Samson? Yeah. Strong man, you know. You ought to check out where he carried the gates up on top of that mountain. I forget how far it was now. He carried... Have you guys ever seen a city gate? <laughs> Not like the gate to your garden, man. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a plaque at home with this thing on it <clears throat> up in, uh, you want to help me out, Anna? Tria, Trier. It's called the Black Gate. This thing is a building, okay? <laughs> and the gate in this thing, you're talking something probably as big as from that wall to that wall anyway. I mean, you've got to be able to get chariots through there, you know, horses and everything else. And they're not made out of slats, you know. I mean, these things are heavy. They're made to withstand attacks. He took the thing, ripped it out of the wall, carried it several miles down the road, up on top of a mountain. How do you think he felt? After sin and blinding, taking away every respect of respect 
or integrity or anything else away from him. I mean, buddy, three strikes, you're out. Delilah was number three. He struck out every time. How do you think he felt down there chained up to that pole, grinding grain, blind as a bat? And then they pulled him out there to mock him in the meeting when they got over, you know, got together to gloat over having whipped him. How do you think he felt? Success? You know what Paul said? For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. <clears throat> now I'm not saying this to encourage you to sin. John says over there in 1 John, These things write I unto you that you sin not, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the right. Now, I'm not trying to encourage you to sin because it will cost you. Will anybody hold their hand up and say it has cost you? But what I'm trying to do is encourage you like Samson. When the time comes, when the time comes, be able to pray as he prayed. Judges chapter 16. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Just once. Lord, you've strengthened me before. you helped me before. Here I am. In such a mess I can't lift up my face. I know what it's going to cost me. But God strengthened me just once more. And he did. Thank you, Lord. And he killed more than the enemy in one move than he had in all his life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'd like to say that God can give the victory, even when the situation seems utterly impossible. You know the story of David and Goliath. So I won't go there for long, but that was impossible. <laughs> Excuse me. David. Now David wasn't, you know, a short little shepherd boy. He was probably a pretty good sized man. I mean, he wouldn't even try to put on Saul's armor if he hadn't been pretty good size. But he went out there against a guy. His shoulders would have been poking out the top of this building, probably. You know what I mean? He's a pretty good sized guy. <laughs> and uh, probably had, you know, biceps about that big. He had a spear that's the size of a weaver's beam, man. You want to go up against that? You think, you, you think David said, hey, I've been slinging stones for years now. You know, I've been throwing them at lions and whatever else. I can handle this guy. You stupid. <laughs> no, sir. He said, I come in the name of the Lord. But hey, what about Joseph? How would you like to be Joseph? Your dad sends you out, you know, you give him a hug, and nobody expected it to happen. What did happen? He got out there, and his brothers stripped his coat of many colors off him, threw him down in the pit, pulled him out of there, sold him to some people. What down he goes into Egypt, never to see any of them again. As far as he, he gets down there in Potiphar's house. You know, he's nothing. Does what he's told, kind of. Potiphar gets looking at him and says, uh, this guy does things pretty well. He handles himself well and starts promoting him. Next thing you know, he's in charge of the whole thing. Gets falsely accused. Down into the jail he goes. He's sitting there for a while before the butler and the baker come in. And then he gets a chance, you know, and he, he interprets their dream to him. And he says to the, to the uh, butler there, the baker, he's going to get hanged. He says to the butler, now you remember, you tell Pharaoh, I'm not supposed to be down here. I didn't do anything. I'm innocent. He said, okay, okay, okay. So what up? Happened just like he said. What the butler do? Nothing. Two years more sitting in the 
prison there. I mean, how many times do you think Joseph said, good grief, man? <sighs> no. I might just as well forget it. I'm stuck in it. Uh, here I am, you know, make the best out of it, but nothing's going to happen. I bet there were times when he laid there on the dirt or whatever they had for him to lay on and thought about those dreams he'd had when he was younger. He said, I must have been crazy. But it happened. Even if it was impossible. The Lord is going to give you the victory. He's going to take care of the situation even when it seems it's beyond all hope. All hope of man. I mean, it's bad enough, you know, being on the Sea of Galilee and standing there trying to dip the water out of the boat with buckets and everything else, you know, and the, the waves throw it in more than you can toss out, and the boat's about to sink, the Lord's in the back of the ship asleep. But the boat's still above the water, at least, and you can still wake him up. Gentlemen, the boat's going to sink. I hate to hurt guys like this in a way. <laughs> said, you know that verse that says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? That goes away. And what do you mean? Eventually you die. See, I'm a born and confirmed pessimist, okay? <laughs> uh, how do you think Mary and Martha felt? I mean, the Lord heard that Lazarus was sick, right? And then stayed where he was. And by the time he got there, Lazarus was dead. Did y'all ever hear that message that Brother Ruckman preaches, you know, from where David tells Jonathan there's but a step between me and death, how he says that death is a final step? It's like, that's it. You see? Uh, a lot of y'all went with me. We buried my wife. I am not going to see her in this world and this life again, period. That's it. And they were looking there saying, so, it's over. He's dead. Tried to get the Lord here. He didn't come. Now what? Bible and look there in John chapter 11. <coughs> I will get you loose here in just a minute. I'm not about to starve yet. John chapter 11. When he does come, Martha says to him in verse 21, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, what sort of thou wilt ask of God, wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Now at that point, if you were smart, you say, oh really? When? Like, now? And he's done that before, you know, that's why she knew that. But you know what she says? I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Well, I know that, Lord. You know, come time for the rapture, yeah, I'll see her again. Now, yeah, I know where she is. And that's good to know, but, uh, you know, it seems impossible, doesn't it? I mean, when they're in the ground, uh, you did notice. Verse 39, the end of the verse, he has been dead four days. It was over, Lord. Missed your chance. No more hope. When you think it's over, Resign thy case into God's hands and leave it there. Trust thou his love, his love's decrees. 
The eternal God thy struggle sees, he hears thy prayers. What, though the tempest howl and rage, he changeth not. Though Satan press thee hard and sore, thy Jesus reigns forevermore, hast thou forgot? No earthly change or seeming woe his work can mar. The things that to thy finite eye seem naught but harm and sad surprise, his working are. Uplift thine eyes, bid doubt be gone. Cast out thy fear, tis faith that gilds the darkened eye. Tis God who wields almighty power, sad heart. Take cheer. Went to... Uh, this is little John's funeral. Shortly after Karen died, I was there going up and down saying hello to people. Well, Wayne Munn walked in and shook his hand and kind of held on to me there a minute. He said, I got one question. Do you trust the Lord? Jesus said, have faith in God. Take heart and hope and comfort and the comfort of the Scripture. Lord, <coughs> ask now a blessing. There's been a lot of personal stuff in here. There's a lot of stuff in your Word, too. And Lord, we, we get discouraged. We give up pretty easy. Lord, we're not made out of life. And Lord, the truth of it is, all we do have, about right now, is faith promises. We see you do some things. We'd like to see you do them. Lord, a lot of it just requires waiting, patience. But you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promises. So we have to wait. Lord, the truth is, we don't have the strength for that either. The truth is, Lord, the Bible is the Lord's and it's you. And eventually, Lord, you will, you will, you will get us through. And the Lord, help us to take strength in that and to trust in you and have faith in God. Comfort our hearts with your word, Lord, tonight and in the days that come up ahead of us, too.